everyone, and welcome to the Vegas Legal Magazine podcast. I'm Mark Fierro with Vegas Legal Magazine publisher, Tyler Morgan. Fierro Communications Vice President, Jeff Haney. Thank you so much for joining us today. Pain management sounds so innocuous. Who would ever expect that it is at the center of a raging war that got its first rush of energy with Oxycontin, the drug that came along about the same time that Western doctors, American doctors specifically, were being criticized for not dealing with pain aggressively enough. Fast forward today, and the buzzword is rehab. Millions, even hundreds of millions of prescriptions written for opioids. More than 42,000 accidental overdose deaths from opioids per year in the United States, and some have suggested a direct link to the explosive growth of heroin addiction. Joining us today, Dr. Neville Campbell of the Center for Wellness and Pain Care of Las Vegas to talk about pain and the many facets of treatment. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for having me. You come along, you're just the right age. You've seen both ends of that spectrum. Doctors were accused of under-treating patients, making them live with pain when it was treatable. Now we've seems we've gone in the other direction. Tell us where we're at. Absolutely. I believe um, I was just uh, talking briefly about what was happening about 10 to 15 years ago regarding how uh, pain was perceived. Pain was considered um, actually a sixth vital sign. Um, that means it's like one of the critical things, like your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breathing rate. These are things that if we don't pay attention to, someone could die. Pain actually got into that category of what we consider a vital sign. And so, you know, um, doctors across the country, hospitals across the country were now forced, actually mandated to recognize and view pain as something that must be, you know, evaluated and managed properly. As a result of that, I believe that um, there was an, you know, over, you know, aggressive management of pain. And I think that is one of the main reasons why we're where we are right now. We're pain at this point. No one even sees it or recognizes it as a critical vital sign anymore. People see pain as something that you know you could do or you know you could either manage or not manage because of where we are right now with the with the opiate crisis. As as always, the people that uh, are hanging in the middle are people who are truly suffering from an underlying disease or uh, uh, trauma, and they have to deal with the headlines. People treat them as addicts when they have a, a, a genuine necessity for some treatment. It must be very difficult to weed out the two. It is more difficult than people would think it really is. Um, because pain is, pain, is, pain is not only the physical. After a certain period of time, pain takes on a mental component. And that mental component is really the difficult part to assess, the difficult part to really understand. We're still trying to understand how the brain evaluates and manage acute pain, which then transitions into chronic pain. For example, you just had your knee scoped. You're gonna have pain from that knee scope. If I smack you on the hand, if I stab you with a, you know, a pencil, you're gonna have pain. But, 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 but um, over the course of time, that acute pain disappears, right? You've, we've all been cut or hit or scratched, and that resolves. But then there is some pain conditions that lingers. Despite the body recovering from the injury, there is still an injury that the brain perceives, and that injury continues and perpetuates. How do you manage that? because you can't really see anything that is physically bleeding or physically broken, but you still have pain. And I think that's where, I, you know, even now, um, um, despite the advances that we've seen in medicine, we're still trying to wrap our minds around the mental component of pain. And it's real. It is real. There is no denying it, because when you look at the brain circuitry, there are indeed changes. But we're still tr like struggling to figure out how do we manage these changes? And are medications the answer? Certainly we've seen that medications are not the answer. Here we are right now, thinking medications were the answer back then, and here we are with a crisis at this time. You know, it's funny, I, I talk to doctors all the time, and um, one thing that they deal with that uh, we really don't realize is patient comes in, they're in pain, and you have, you know, the stereotypical pain scale, you know, one to 10, what is your pain? And patients will come in and say, well, 
it's a 10 out of 10. Well, 10 out of 10 is, you know, like my arm is cut off and I need an injection of morphine and, you know, I need to get to the hospital. So with that, that arrow through the head. Current, yeah. That so, but with that said, it becomes an issue of how do we sort of measure what the pain scale is among from patient That's to patient. That's a really good question. Because yeah. you also have patients where I've seen guys who've had just severe back injuries, but they're younger guys, they're active, and you know they have a high pain tolerance. So they go in, they see the doctor, they get you know recommended therapy, but they're kind of eh, whatever. You know, I can I, I, I can deal with it. But now, you know, you go from that patient to the one that's got, you know, I'm a 10 out of 10 because I slipped my finger open, you know, and then it becomes this whole ordeal of, well, now we got to go to medications and dosage of medication and how we handle this. So I, I don't really know how you properly educate a patient on understanding their own pain scale. Yeah, I think I told them that, I, I had an, I, I was at an eight and a half once because I had a really bad yeah. sore throat. They gave, they gave me a dirty <laughs> look. And I was like, well, yeah, right now, yeah, it is. That, that was that was to me. the the first honest answer off the top of my yeah. head. But yeah. if you go to if you go to like the lay person and you say, oh, my pain's up a four or a three and a half, it, it just sounds like okay, what are yeah, you complaining about? Sure. Here. And you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why the International Society of Pain, um, who really define what pain really is. Um, you know, they define pain as actual or perceived um, damage to tissue, right? So, you know, actual, you know, as in, you know, yes, you can see something that's actually there or something that is perceived, which means that you can't really see it, but does it mean that it's not there? Um, I'll give you an example. Um, my, my, um, my cousin, really good guy, um, you know, he broke his, 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 his forearm many years ago, right? Um, and we all watched him. He was cast. And then, you know, we saw when the cast was removed later on. Now you can look at his arm. There is really nothing that you can see, right? You know, the bone is healed, right? I mean, he can lift, he can put, but every so often, he still has pain at that broken site, exactly. despite the fact that the injury has long since been resolved, right? And so, you know, can we really tell him that you're not experiencing pain? Can I tell him that when the weather changes and he's like, oh, it's gonna rain tomorrow, and we all look at him like he's crazy. Okay, you mentioned And then the yeah, it actually rains because the changes in barometric pressure, those subtle changes, I, we still don't really understand. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. How like that how happens that and how that works. But patients with chronic pain at times can predict weather changes, can predict when there's going to be a change in the humidity, the barometer, because they start feeling that even before. Yeah, I think we all know someone concept. like that, and you, you might dismiss it as an old wives' tale, but evidently but there's, there's something to it. Yeah. You know, I, I, th I can't imagine how difficult, because of all the diagnostic abilities that we have, pain is the, the one that's an absolute vacuum. You have to right. talk to the person, and that's, right. you know, if they've got a spiral break, you know that there's pain there. One of the things that when, when I, and I've had several clients um, who did um, hip and knee replacements, mm -hmm. and um, to talk about extremes of perception, one of their biggest problems is men in, uh, uh, specifically will continue to walk on a joint that is ground down to nothing. This, I, this could have been minimally invasive two years ago. You've been walking on close to bone to bone and people habituate to it if they want to. Right. And in other cases, it can be the slightest case and it turns into a tent. All of that's complicated by drug seekers. Right. And that we have a, do, do you, are you seeing more? Are you seeing less? Have we hit a high point? Where are we with drug seeking in the United States today? So I think, and I, I'm speaking you know, to my practice, which I think is a you know, small microcosm of what's really happening because people are people all around the country, right? Um, you sample Las Vegas and that really is a sample you know, of any major city that you might come across We're in the US. We're all from some places. Exactly, well. right? And so, you know, the people that you'll see will likely have similar motives, will likely have similar wants and needs, similar conditions. Um, in my practice, what I've seen is that, um, you, know, the, the, you know, our ability to identify the drug seekers has certainly improved because now we're actually somewhat mandated and forced to look Whereas before, the, 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 the screening criteria is the things that would use the gauge. Oftentimes, because there was no really you know, oversight or, or, or strict oversight, um, you know, we, we would miss 
a lot of people who were really in the system trying to work the system and trying to get drugs for whatever reason, whether it's for their personal use or to utilize it, you know, on a market to sell, to, to you know, for gain, et cetera. Um, now I see that, you know, now we are capturing more because we're required to capture more. We are now being held responsible. And I think that was the missing part, or that was part of the puzzle that was missing as to why we are in this, I'd say, conundrum right now is because that, that accountability um, really wasn't being enforced, right? It was there but no one was requiring that we screen, requiring that before you came into me and I dispense, no, I'm sorry, and I prescribe um, oxycodone or, or, or um, hydrocodone, that I complete a full history, physical examination. I look to see any sort of outside records or imaging findings, objective data that you might have that actually speaks to the pathology, the condition that you're complaining of. And I make sure as a medical provider with the medical knowledge that it all makes sense, right? Medically, your history is agreeing with the physical examination that I'm taking and that is matching any imaging studies that you've got. So when it's all in sync, then, then you know, there is an argument here that indeed you may benefit from you know medication management or opiate management. But even then, that's not the first step. Whenever you're prescribing, there is a ladder approach to managing pain. You don't start off, and I think that was happening a lot. Someone comes up you know, in with chronic pain, barely being assessed, oxy 30s or you know, oxy 15s. That is completely inappropriate, and that is deviating you know, away from you know, the basic tenets of pain management. Right, you gotta start off conservatively. Have you tried physical therapy? Have you tried some over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen? All right, you know, have you tried the basics? Because oftentimes, believe it or not, um, a simple muscle strain, you don't need a massive amount of medications. You need some stretching, you need some ice, you need some heat, you need some, you know, some muscle exercises to release the tension in those muscles. And then, you know, in a couple of days, you're back. Right? But doctors were initiating aggressive medical management. They were going to stage three of that ladder right away for conditions that they barely even understood or knew what they were treating because they did not complete a proper assessment, did not come up with a proper diagnosis. So how can you truly initiate correct treatment if you haven't done that? You, you look at some of these uh, drug deaths, um, they're just heartbreaking, and they're and they're started by a football injury on a football field, a high school kid, and and because the doctor says here's oxy, and the mom goes along with it, and next thing you know, the kid's in for 30 days. Well, 30 days is the magic number. They've got a problem now, right. and they're probably right. going to have a problem right. for years to come right. unless there's somebody who right. who intervenes. Didn't Mark? Didn't you mention a like a statistic a long time ago about? Um, using oxycontin and then it was like if you're on it for a specific amount of time it was like some high correlation that you're eventually going to end up using heroin or absolutely something the doctors will only go for will go with you for so long and and the the aha moment the big fork in the road i had a doctor tell me you know there are there are patients who have had uh, spinal surgeries that have been in major car accidents and they're, you know, they're in that age range of 70 years old and they come into an office and they're a perfect candidate. Of course, this is the person that they're going to give oxy to. And the doctor looks clearly in their eyes and says, if you'll take a urine test right now and there's any oxy in your system, I'll, I'll give you $100 because you're not using these drugs. You're selling all of them. You're living <laughs> off of this. And they get up and walk out the door. Yeah. Uh, doctor, yeah. Is, is there a big growth in heroin addiction as a result of the opioid crisis? How, how big of a problem um, is that from, from your view? Um, well, we've seen that in the past four or five years, there have been an increase in opiate, in, um, in um, heroin use, you know, usage and even deaths related to heroin. We've seen that. Why? Because I, about three or four years ago, or five years ago, we started thinking about what's happening with these um, very potent opiate pain management drugs, and that we're still using them. We use them, and despite increasing the dose, people get more tolerant. The benefit that people were getting from them, they're getting less benefit. We're giving more and more and more and more. Um, we're, we're 
where people are at, you know, in terms of morphine milli equivalents, because that's how they grade it. Mm -hmm. Like if you convert the medication to morphine, currently the recommendation is that you do not exceed 90 milli equivalents of morphine per day, which you might think is a lot, but in the chronic pain world, people will laugh at you for that. They will say that will not touch me at all because people were being managed with a thousand plus milli equivalents a day. People were taking oxy thirties, um, you know, you know, eight, nine, 10 tablets a day, plus taking an extended release, like morphine 100 you know, milligrams extended release three times a day, plus coupling that with, you know, sedatives and, you know, muscle relaxants like Soma, which are, and so, you know, we realized after a, a number of years that this might not be the right approach. And so doctors were already beginning to curtail um, their, 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 their prescribing habits. And so when they began to say, you know what, maybe I'm going to cut you off, I'm going to cut you down, that's when we gradually began to see people, people started seeking, well, look, if I'm not going to get it here, I'm going to get it somewhere else. And the reason is, it's not for a high, right? Believe it or not, it's not for a high. People stop taking opiates because it's a high, because after a while, your brain gets used to that high and that dissipates. Now you just can't come off. And it's the feeling that you get when you stop the medication. It's the withdrawals. It's feeling like you cannot continue life because you don't feel the same way. It's not the high anymore because the high after a, you know, after a very short period of time, that becomes extinct. And then you become dependent and addicted where you go into withdrawals. You feel like you cannot function if you stop taking the medication. Mm. And then you'll go to great lengths to maintain or to have the medication so you can have that feeling. Is that what they refer to as maintenance versus going into withdrawal? That so that's very different. So they're, so, so they're competing, you know, not competing, but, you know, people oftentimes misunderstand, um, you know, addiction versus dependence. If I have you on even some cardiac medications, right? So for your heart, right? Um, if I take those medications away, you're gonna have a, a physical, you know, a physiological response. Your heart will start racing. You might start sweating. All that. That's where you're dependent. You're not addicted. You're dependent. Addiction becomes when you have those feelings, but then you started, but then you begin to do things that is very questionable to get the medications or to get that feeling again. So whether it's breaking the law, whether it's selling all that you have, whether it's trading the things that are valuable, you begin to do things that harm you and harm others around you in order to get access. That's addiction. So oftentimes people come in and you'll see them in withdrawals. No, I mean, withdrawals happen to almost anybody if you're on any medications or certain medications for a certain period of time, not just opiates. Right, you can have withdrawals from you know various classes of medications where your body has a physiologic response, but that doesn't mean that you're addicted. Several of my patients, they will go into withdrawals. That's why you know people come in on a 30-day cycle if they're being managed for you know chronic pain conditions with opiates, and you refill their medications. You don't let them go eight weeks, nine weeks, because during that interval when they don't have the medication, they really can go into severe physiologic response in their bodies. They won't die, but it just will not feel well. They can't perform, you know? And so th there's a clear difference there that we need to understand. I, I worked on the Michael Jackson mm. case, the death case. And um, the, Michael Jackson had chosen, uh, long before he ever met Dr. Murray, propofol as a way of dealing with his chronic insomnia. And uh, he'd become quite proficient at procuring it from mm -hmm. doctors who wanted to be around stars mm -hmm. and 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 to their credit also just simply wanted to help right because he was a sympathetic uh, character towards the end of his life he um, people knew that he was in desperate financial straits but what he never told anyone uh, what he had had never mentioned anyone is that was the reason for his insomnia and that was that he was taking up to 375 milligrams from a different doctor. Oh, wow. 375 milligrams of Demerol a day. That's just to put this in perspective, 
Um, if we all split up 375 milligrams of Demerol, we'd all be dead. I'll probably stop mm. breathing immediately. Immediately. With a and, quarter of that. And, and this is a man <laughs> who weighed 130 pounds. Right. And so, you know, when, when you get patients, how difficult is it to divine their, their ongoing, these, these underlying currents of other drugs that they may be taking, street drugs that they may be taking. Right. I, I, I have uh, listened, uh, because we've worked with rehab as well, I've listened to patients who are, who are going through rehab and they know the prescriptions probably as well as you do. Mm -hmm. They live by this. Mm -hmm. It's their currency. It's their life. How do you divine? How do you work through that to make sure that you're not becoming part of the problem instead of part of the, an the answer instead of the problem? That's a great question. I think before I, I'm going to answer that, and I think that's what the new laws, the new requirement, the that AB 474 is requiring that you know we have measures in place so that we don't continue to contribute to the problem. Before I answer that though, you just mentioned um, and beautifully described um, you know what tolerance really is with Michael Jackson requiring 375 milligrams of Demerol, whereas you know for a guy like you and I, a quarter of that will cause us to stop breathing immediately. That's our body's ability. We become tolerant, and that's why over time, you know, there's a, you know, there's, you know, there were the remote primary care doctors in different places by themselves, and all they knew was just to keep, just, just to keep dose escalating. So, okay, so oxy thirty doesn't work. Let's double it. Mm. Let's give you oxy sixty. Oxy sixty then works for a little while. Then that becomes ineffective. Oh, you know what? Let's let's go up to you know oxy eighties. That becomes effective for a while, then loses efficacy. Well, you know what? Let's go to 120. And this slow progress, this slow climb, if you're not attentive, if you're running around seeing X amount of patients, or you just quickly refill, you go up each time, lo and behold, a year later, you're like, oh my gosh, we started at 30, and now I'm at 180 milligrams, right? How did we get here? But the body has an amazing ability to to develop tolerance. That's one of the things that we cannot, we haven't figured it out yet how to deal with. And that's why a lot of medications that work all of a sudden loses their efficacy. We're still trying to figure out how does our mind, you know, become and allow our bodies to become tolerant to the effects of these medications. That's what happened in Michael's cases. And, and so, you know, um, when patients come to us now, and I notice that they're on these massive doses, it is your role, it's our role as providers to slowly begin to de-escalate. You can't stop it. You can't. That's a disservice. That's you're doing that patient. Uh, you know. You and know, some doctors you know, are trying, they, right? I mean, they right. actually will try and shut it of down, shut a patient it, down. You cannot. Someone comes to you on those ridiculously high doses, and you take on that management by entering into a doctor-patient relationship with that patient. You cannot stop the medications. You cannot drastically cut it by 50, 70 percent. You will send that patient into withdrawals. That's not good. That's not good doctor. Med That's not good medicine. You slowly work with that patient, establish and build that relationship, right? You come in, you see me, we make eye contact. You tell me what your goals are. It, if I agree, I say yes. If, the, if I disagree, but eventually we come up with a plan where it's a mutual thing. It's not me sitting here telling you what to do as the doctor, but it's what your plan is, what my plan is. And then let's put the plans together to move you into a place that is safe and that's better for you. And over time, you know, I have won over several patients. I, and I mean, we have over five, over 5,000 practice in our, you know, 5,000 patients in our practice and several people came in from different providers on really high dose opiates. And over time, won their confidence, slowly moved them down into a place where now they're feeling better, they're looking better, their countenance is better. Why? Because these medications have more than 75% been removed from their system. Right, and that's where I think doctors need to really take the role and take it and aggressively march forward and provide help for the patients who are seeking help. We're, we're dealing with a situation right now that um, it, it's, there are a thousand cross currents here, but one of the biggest classes in addition to everything else that's going on with pain 
uh, one of the biggest clash classes is uh, our veterans. Uh, for we're, Hidden behind all the war statistics and being at war for 17 years, in addition to that, a whole heck of a lot fewer people die on the battlefield on the American side now. Irrespective of how badly their bodies are mangled, right. we're able to keep them alive. Right. And that means when they come back, they've got a lot of work to do before their bodies will be whole. And VA doctors are among the very first to throw large doses of not just oxy, but all of these other addicting drugs as well. Mm -hmm. Today, talking with somebody who's charged with a very, very serious crime, and I won't get into that right now. He'll be on the show next week. But I will say this. He's a good man. He's got children. He loves his family. He was on 11, 11 prescriptions. 11, 11 different kinds of prescription pills, mostly as a result of P uh, PTSD after his uh, service. Straight from wow. the VA, straight as a result of his protecting our country. He decides, after talking with his friends, other veterans, that he's going to try medical marijuana. He yeah. gets a card and he uses medical marijuana and he uses it in a very disciplined fashion. Mm -hmm. He'll only use it once a day. He'll only use it after the kids are asleep and everything else. Immediately goes off of nine, doesn't wean him, doesn't, mm -hmm. says he didn't need to wean himself off of, just stopped taking nine of those. And some of them are dangerous drugs like right. Zoloft and a couple of yeah. them. And was able, was able to wean himself off of all of these drugs. I have yet to see a doctor, a rehab doc, pain clinician that truly embraces medical marijuana. This has to be a strange time to be a doctor in your position. How do you come down on, on, on that question? Well, I think you finally met one. <laughs> okay. Good for you. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear so, it. So, um, you know, I, I started looking at the data um, that surrounds, you know, the use of medical marijuana for various conditions. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it was emerging. It was emerging, emerging, emerging. And I think now the body of evidence um, has arrived and it's undeniable. I think it's only a matter of time before, you know, if this that's happening, you know, on the state level is, 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 is replicated across the entire country and then begins to affect what's happening on the federal level as well. It's only a matter of time. You know, I think there are various entities that, you know, are trying to, um, you know, you know, manage how things flow now because they too have realized the benefits of marijuana when used in a medical fashion. And so, um, you know, oftentimes when there are financial interests, you know, to gain, then people then, you know, if, if, if I don't control the space, let me limit or help to regulate the space so that it can move into my favor. So when it does become, you know, I, you know, at the point where it's available like that, then I have some sort of a majority position in what is to be benefited financially from it. The data is here. The data was in Europe before. It was in Canada before. Now the U.S. is confronted with the data. Um, there's a study that came out about a year and a half ago that I got from um, the Nevada Medical Board um, uh, regarding the benefits of medical marijuana because so much talk was going on uh, you know, about it, what was, gonna, what was about to happen in the state of Nevada. So, of course, we had to talk about it. And so um, the study was done by the American Association of Medicine, American Association of Engineering, and another entity, another big entity in the U.S. And um, it was a 450-page document that they came up with. The summary alone was about 35 pages. I went to the section for pain management specifically, but there are several indications for um, the utilization of marijuana. And so, um, you know, there is, you know, for cancer-related, you know, nausea and vomiting for people with seizures. I, being a chronic pain specialist and a pain management specialist, I went to the section to look at its efficacy for chronic pain. And the conclusion was, without a doubt, with, without a doubt, there is overwhelming evidence that marijuana has a role, has a benefit in the management of chronic pain conditions. We're still trying to define how to use it appropriately, how to dose it appropriately, but there's no question. It is and will be a major player in the management of people with chronic pain, especially now that we have seen where we have become with the opiate crisis and what it has done to us here in the U.S. More data, more research is going into it right now. I have been a strong proponent of this since last year, since the year before last, and I've always recommended to my patients with chronic pain, give it a shot, give it a shot. 
give it a shot and see. It won't work. And from what I've seen, anecdotally, it hasn't worked for everyone, but there's certain patients, there's, there's a vast majority of people that I've recommended. They've gotten their cards. They went to the dispensary. They've gotten you know, different uh, formulations, whether it is a topical, whether it's an edible, whether it's uh, something that is a, you know, a vaporized, etc. They've gotten whatever they need to get. They come and they're completely off opiates right now. Off well, opiates. You know, it's it's. I feel like it's almost like it's a political drive. The people who are in rehab are their only vote is for 100% abstinence from everything. Don't take anything. Don't drink. Don't do anything else. But of all of the pain, of all the pain, of all the trauma that we see that uh, that Americans go through, our veterans, you know, they didn't come about this pain dishonestly. It was in it was you know the if it was in service to their country the highest calling, and and it seems like somebody if, if anybody was going to get cut you would hope if anybody was going to get cut an honest deal it would right. be the veterans right. and and they're the ones that are teaching each other about the benefits of uh, not only marijuana but CBD oils right. as well right. but CBD has just exploded is it as effective as topically as people say that it is. So, you know, the data, um, you know, looked at various applications of CBD. And of course, you're taking people's, um, you know, subjective um, responses. Um, you know, again, I can only speak anecdotally from the people that I've treated, developed a relationship with. And I saw struggling through their uh, chronic back pain after having five lumbar spine surgeries. There's metal everywhere. Um, there's no way I, I can look at that person when I look at that X-ray, that MRI, and say, or, you know, you know, or that CT, and say you don't have pain when there's a fusion from you know S1 to L1. Mm. There's rods and screws everywhere. The the range of motion in the back is just so limited. I don't know how I can make an argument to that patient that 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 I hear she has no pain when the body wasn't really designed for those metallic instrumentations Definitely. to be there, right? So you're going to have, I mean, they're nerve fibers that are running close, running around, wrapping to the side, and every move you move, every turn you turn, you're likely to feel some of the effects of mm -hmm. that. And um, I've had these patients with massive doses of opiates come to me, and um, we've talked about a plan. We've brought them down to a point where it's reasonable and acceptable based on the current guidelines of 90 milli, you know, 90 milli equivalents of morphine, and still they have pain, and we recommend, why don't you try some topicals? Just like you try topical lidocaine, right? That's available over the counter, and I'm, I'm sorry, you know, that's available now you know, through prescription, and people buy it and use it and get benefit. Try topical, or try another form, and I've seen people with topical get benefit. Again, does it really fix the underlying problem? Can we really fix the underlying problem of chronic pain? I don't think we can. But can we manage? Can we help people with their symptoms? Can we give them some quality of life? Right? Allow them to do the things that they consider important, whether it's walking the dog, whether it's taking a stroll with you know, their significant other a block or two down the road. The simple things, whether it's washing the dishes for five minutes, whether it's just sitting in the, the, the sofa watching TV, can I give them that quality of life that they desire, right? And so I believe that it is, and well, it should be, and this is where it's going to become a part of the treatment algorithm. Just the same way I use, you know, an ibuprofen and a muscle relaxant for people with tight muscles, and maybe an opiate if the pain is really strong, right? Physical therapy to help. I think this has to become a part of the treatment algorithm. Because does it have benefits? Absolutely. Why should it not be a part of the algorithm? That's where we need to be. It's, we know this much. This is the really good news, is that of all of the things that that long list of scary side effects that every drug that's advertised on television, uh, the... Um, you know, the side effects from marijuana are what? You, the, the bag of dis Doritos disappears. You know, the, <laughs> the, the, the list of side effects is scant. And that is what we do know. Right. That is what we do right. know. Well, it's uh, interesting. The same gentleman uh, Mark was referring to before who was able to eliminate most of his prescription medications also said that when he was on all those uh, prescription pills, 
he was constantly so run down that he had to drink three large cans of an energy drink yeah. just to get out of bed in just the morning and get going. And when he switched over to the medical cannabis, he's, in his words, every morning I'm, I'm up and at him yeah. immediately. So that seems to be a rather positive step it, as well. It, it's uh, not, not to go too far, Drip, but, but also as part of because it because it is on point. He ended up going to jail for a very, very specific reason. But when he got to jail, of course, they're not going to give him medical marijuana. But what they would do is they gave him back five or six of his prescriptions. <laughs> and he went right back to being right. as depressed right. and as lethargic as, as he ever was. So... It's I, 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 you of all docs, I, I feel your, your pain because there is no x-ray to take there. There is no, you have to, you have to divine this for yourself. And, and, and that comes with skill of years. Right. And I think that's, that's, you know, when people say medicine is, you know, an art and a science, really, um, that is the art portion of medicine. And that's what you try to gain through your years of training. Um, the medical knowledge, believe it or not, you sit down in a year or two, you can learn 60, 70% of that knowledge and then over time you can refine that. But the skill aspect, the aspect of taking a good history, the aspect of connecting with that patient, the, a the aspect of you know, performing a solid physical examination and then combining that all, making sense of it, and then formulating a treatment plan, that is what takes time. That's why people spend years in residency and years in medical school and in residency and then fellowship training because you need to refine that as you go because people are so different. Right? Ten years from now, where, where are we going to be? Do you think that this, the opiate crisis will be behind us? Are we? Is that wishful thinking? I think it will be decreased but not behind us. Um, I don't know if we can ever eliminate. I mean, I think attempts are being made, but soon we're going to realize that... Um, it is impossible to eliminate, um, you know, opiates from the treatment algorithm. Uh, do they have a role? Yes, they have a role. But I think uh, it, it's going to require, you know, a judicious, you know, um, some effort on the part of practitioners to realize when is necessary to apply that to the algorithm. But it won't be gone. And I think what's going to happen as we begin to now aggressively curtail the utilization we're going to realize that um, we're going to have several other problems that gonna, that's, that's going to pop up, right? You know, we trade one, but we're going to have several others to contend with. They, you know, most of, you know, a lot of which we will not see now, but come five years from now, we're going to see various things that, um, like, for example, people are now utilizing gabapentin, you know, a medication that is you know, used to manage nerve pain. It's also called Neurontin. People are now taking massive doses of this having overdoses of these. And now we're realizing um, how detrimental that this can be before it was being prescribed like water, right? So um, in the absence of the opiates, people are substituting with other things like heroin. That's on the rise. People are now on the streets getting medications from wherever they possibly can and mixing and making and inventing things that should not be injected, snorted or swallowed but just because they want to get back to that place where they were. And so we're, we're creating, you know, another set of issues that we're yet to see because now they're in that dormant phase. But I think in, in a few years from now, we're going to see a lot of issues emerging. Why? Because we've taken people so drastically away from the medications versus tapering them appropriately. Additionally, I believe that we might see a surge in violence as it's directed towards physicians and offices who take a position um, to either not prescribe or to stop prescribing. Um, because as people get desperate, then um, they will be, um, uh, you, know, if, you know, out of desperation, be driven to do things that they would otherwise regret and sometimes can't even go back on. I think we're starting to see that in Las Vegas. Um, I've seen a number of uh, home video uh, surveillance cameras of break-ins, and um, I've always been a student of details. And one of the things that you notice is that person that's breaking into that home, they have designer sneakers. They're wearing clean clothes. They've got a decent haircut. 
This is a person who still has a job. They're standing in front of a surveillance camera, but they don't know not to do that because they haven't been to prison yet because they've only been on heroin for a few months now and they've just hit that desperation. Mm -hmm. You're seeing mm -hmm. a regular American mm -hmm. for the first time in their mm -hmm. lives mm -hmm. hitting bottom and it's right there in video and it's absolutely frightening when you see, and I think those numbers for the time being at least are only gonna go up because you know, Las Vegas was one of the first cities to be to be targeted yeah. by the Mexican, and it's not the cartels, it's, uh, by the um, hand delivered from the rancheros. It, it went to Portland and one other city, and then it came to Las Vegas. And they're very effect, very effective. They're very good retailers. They're nonviolent. They're very wow. friendly. They're consumer friendly. If you have a problem with their drugs, they'll gladly replace it. <laughs> and they're almost impossible to catch by the police because they don't use guns and they use a second person acting right. as a buffer. And so, what I've I have watched drug deals go down in malls, uh, at right outside of restaurants in the light of day with the dealer or the big smile on their face right. and the patient that is obviously, they look like they've got a ton of cement on their shoulders mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're addicts. Right. But I, I think that's just, just now sort of that desperation, yeah. that next level of desperation. I pray that there, that you have something in your, in your quiver of arrows to help us. And the idea that you're open to the idea of using medical marijuana as a strategic tool, I think is hooray for you. And, Thank you. and good luck for your patience as Thank well. You. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And with that, we will call it a day. We would like to thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. I really do appreciate it. Uh, one of the things that uh, we like to do is we play a little game, and we're kind of downtown focused. Okay. And that is what is, give us. Think of your downtown restaurants. What are your favorite restaurant downtown Las Vegas? Let's hear it. Oh, one or two. Um, there is a, is, is it in the D Hotel? What's the name of it? There's a restaurant in the D. I like D. your thinking already. Old, I love everything like, Derek does. It's, it's uh, old, like. Andiamo, um, Italian. Um, you know, I'm blanking on the name, but uh, just an amazing restaurant. It's a steakhouse in the D Hotel. Uh -huh. It's 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 their only steakhouse. There you are. Yeah. Andiamo, the Andiamo, Andiamo Steakhouse. Yeah, yeah it's, I see it's, the signs. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. That that terrific. Terrific. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Love that place. Beautiful stuff. Yeah. yeah. Go. Also downtown, moving on from favorite restaurant, how about favorite bar? Ah, favorite bar. Um, there is a, um, and I'm bad with names, by the way, but, but there's a, a little Mexican place, like right off Fremont Street. Uh, Comida. Yes, Comida. yes, yes, yes. I'm Amazing. With you. I'm with you. Their margaritas are just absolutely to die Right for. at 6th Street. Yeah, I'm yes, with you as well. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. Love that place. Yep. They yep. do everything yep. right. They okay, so everything. getting out of the uh, downtown area, what is your definition of success? Hmm. Deep question. I think success has to do with the lives that you touch, the lives that you impact on your journey here. We're all on this journey, I believe. At some point in time, you become off the stage, off the scene. But what's your impact? I think your impact is tied into the success that okay. you achieve. Amen, brother. Yeah. I like the way you think. With that, we call it a day in the Vegas Legal Podcast. Tyler Morgan, publisher of Vegas Legal Magazine. Thanks for doing the good work and bringing new life to the legal community in Southern Nevada. Jeff Haney, Vice President of Fiero Communications, the friendliest PR company in Southern Nevada. For all of you out there with a story, a story idea, an axe to grind, get a hold of Vegas Legal, the leading magazine in Southern Nevada, a legal market, you can call Tyler at 702-222-3476. Reach out, tell us, tell your friends. We're out of here. <laughs>